past month, Israelis have been protesting, calling for social reforms to ease economic hardship. Max Blumenthal is an award-winning journalist and best-selling author. Welcome to Palestine Studies TV. I'm your host, Will Yeomans. Thank you for joining us, Max. Great to be on with you. For more than a month now, Israelis have been demonstrating in major cities, setting up tent camps. Who are these protesters and what are they demanding? Well, the mainstream of the demonstrators are um, really representative of the um, Jewish secular mainstream um, in Tel Aviv. And the protest began on July 14th in Tel Aviv on Rosh Rothschild Boulevard. Rothschild Boulevard, which is uh, sort of a symbolic area. It's sort of a, it's a very long grass lined uh, boulevard that people walk on. It's one of the few major public spaces in Tel Aviv besides the beach. And it resembles the strolling grounds of Theodore Herzl's Halcyon Days in Vienna. Um, they pitch tents um, across from the Habima Theater, which is famous for reviving the Hebrew language, and right next to Dizengoff House, which was where Ben-Gurion signed uh, the declaration of the Jewish, the quote-unquote Jewish and democratic state. So they chose a location that I think was rich with uh, early Zionist symbolism. And this is, a, in my opinion, a Zionist protest in a way. Um, and these demonstrators, uh, you know, they had pitched tents right after the Week of Rage, which was a demonstration against high prices, uh, mainly carried out by leftists. They poured cottage cheese on the Likud party headquarters and um, also were protesting the anti-democratic laws um, passing through the Knesset, like the boycott law, which uh, essentially criminalizes free speech in Israel. But when the tent protesters came out, um, they told us that they weren't protesting these anti-democratic laws, that their protest was strictly limited to um, the high price of rent, to high food prices, um, to the fact that young people um, within the Jewish Israeli middle class have to work longer hours um, and receive less. And they, were, they really struck a chord in Israeli Jewish society um, for a lot of reasons, but everyone was hurting because of the economic liberalization project, which has been, which the Israeli government's been carrying out since actually 1986. This is what people don't realize. You know, Netanyahu is the symbol of exploitation because he exploits everyone between the river and the, and the sea, including Jews. That's like the essence of Netanyahu. So he's a perfect symbol of, of, uh, for them to lash out at. But Shimon Peres, um, the supposed you know laborite dove is the one who initiated the economic liberalization project. And he followed it by pushing um, Yitzhak Rabin to sign the Oslo Accords because he realized Israel's economy couldn't become world class unless Israel first uh, resolved the Palestinian situation and uh, became legitimate in the eyes of the Western world. So you had two parallel um, phenomena playing out uh, actually that were actually linked um, starting from 1986, the growth of the Israeli economy, the big growth of the R&D sector, um, thanks to economic liberalization, and Oslo, which actually for Palestinians resulted in the first electrified fences going up around Gaza. Um, and Rabin and um, one of his closest um, advisors and allies, Haim Ramon, who's really identified with the Zionist left, conceived first, well before Ariel Sharon and his uh, people, uh, the, the separation wall, sort of a concrete separation between Palestinians and Israelis. The slogan of the Oslo era was us over here, them over there. And now we've seen both of these trends come to fruition through these protests, um, where people are protesting the ravages of economic liberalization, that Israel's economy continues to grow, but it leaves more and more people behind and the public sector is getting destroyed. And the protest ignores Palestinians living under occupation because they've been walled off, thanks to um, you know the process initiated by Oslo and completed with the unilateral disengagement of Gaza and the unilateral construction of the separation wall. So it's essentially uh, they're 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 calling out for social justice in this protest all across the country. Um, their their big slogan is the people demands social justice, but the people are only those 
who live inside the walls, not all those under Israeli control. And their concept of social justice excludes Palestinians under occupation, not because they hate Palestinians per se, but because they don't see them. They've become invisible. And it's a protest of the Zionist left. But who is to blame for the disappearance of the Palestinians? It all started with the Zionist left. We have a question from Twitter that's related to that, actually. What has to happen uh, to make the protesters speak about the occupation? It's not going to happen. The, um, it will never happen. And this is sort of a, an indictment of, uh, or it reflects really badly on my friends in the Israeli left, um, who, including those among the Israeli radical left who are like real veteran anti-occupation activists who've made real sacrifices, who have now given themselves over to this July 14th movement and who are writing that it will somehow deal with the occupation. And I can tell you, like most of my friends in Tel Aviv who I consider to be really heroic um, activists against the occupation, many of them at least, have this belief that they'll go in through the back door and that they'll handle the occupation by going in, uh, by, in, in some sort of subtle way. Uh, Dini Ryder, who writes for 972 Mag, wrote this, this protest is challenging something deeper than the occupation, which kind of reminds me of like Obama campaign rhetoric. It just doesn't, it doesn't match up to empirical evidence. Um, the reason the radical left and people on the left in Israel are saying this is because they are, they've become part of the mainstream of the protest, if not the avant-garde, because they're veteran demonstrators. They have the tactics. Many of them were arrested in the big Tel Aviv demonstration on July 26th. And usually their arrests are ignored at anti-occupation protests, but this time they were prime time news. And when they came out of jail, they were treated as heroes by the mainstream of Israeli society. So for once they weren't stigmatized. They didn't have to be a tribe within the tribe in one of the most tribalistic societies. They were like coming back home to their families. Um, so from a psychological level, this movement has been very encouraging to the left, but in the end, I think they're gonna be left high and dry and it's gonna reflect really badly on them. I spoke to Gidi Greenstein, who is the head of the Rayut Institute. And uh, you might have heard of him because the Rayut Institute does all the work on delegitimization. Um, he's a confidant of Ehud Barak. He was one of the more hardline negotiators during Camp David. He's basically a proxy of the government. And I asked him why isn't, you know, he was speaking at the Zionist Organization of America's House in Tel Aviv about the protests. And I. I raised the question because no one else in the room dared to even mention the word occupation, I think because they don't even see it anymore in Israel. And he said, yes, it's highly unusual to have a social justice demonstration that doesn't mention occupation. Uh, and the reason is most Israelis don't actually believe there's an occupation. They see the Palestinian Authority and they see Salam Fayyad and they think there's a functioning government. They see the statehood resolution and they think Palestine will soon become a state and they basically don't see Palestinians. So there's this cognitive dissonance in Israeli society. You have to just look at Israel for the way it is and, and not in the same way that liberals in the 2008 Obama campaign tried to imagine Obama as something that he wasn't and didn't look at his record. Obama himself said, I'm a blank screen people project their aspirations on. Those who oppose the occupation and the violation of Palestinian rights by Israel are uh, many of them are projecting their own aspirations onto this movement because the movement is so inclusive. But really what the movement is, is a sort of revival of the Zionist left. Uh, for the sake of clarification, um, are you saying that the occupation is not visible to them because they believe that the Palestinian Authority is an independent and separate functioning government? Or is it because they see much of the West Bank as belonging uh, to Israel somehow? Well, yeah, both of those are true, and both of those are reasons, but the, the rightful Israeli claim over what they call Judea and Samaria is really, um, that's something that people on the right, Likudniks, and those who are suspicious of these protests believe. Um, I think from the perspective of young, secular Tel Avivians, um, there is a physical separation from Palestinians. They don't see them um, because of the separation principle because of the separation wall, the siege of Gaza. Uh, there are like 40,000 or 50,000 workers who work inside Israel proper from the occupied territories, and they're referred to as ghost workers because they have to operate 
almost invisibly, and they have to pay people off to doctor their permits. Uh, my Palestinian friends who come through the wall to see me, you know, they they're basically infiltrating in. Uh, when I'm, you know, when they wanted to come, some of my friends came to see the tent protests the other night, um, and they basically had to s sneak in and pretend that they weren't from the West Bank, and that's that's so that's the reality inside Israel. On the other hand, there are Palestinian citizens of Israel who are in, involved on the periphery of these protests. But with the important distinction is that the mainstream of the protesters, and you can just talk to any of the July 14th protesters who are Jewish Israelis, they'll say this is not a political protest. This is apolitical. Um, the Palestinian cause is explicitly socio-political. And so when in Jaffa, when you go down and visit the tents, they're talking about 1948. They're talking about housing discrimination and racism and all the issues that, that many of them only own 70% of their house. The state actually controls 30% of their house, these things. So they are taking advantage of the opportunity and hoping to have their voice heard. But at the same time, um, for example, my friend Abir Kapti, who is part of the tent, 1948 tent, um, which is the only represent, you know, tent that presents the Palestinian um, identity and narrative on Ross Shield Boulevard, told me, uh, I'm not a part of this protest. I'm actually just here to challenge them. But the Palestinian struggle started a long time ago, and it's going to continue long after this. Then if you ask the, the leadership of the, these protests about the Palestinian citizens of Israel who are around, who are participating, they will point to them as a, as an example of um, the true, you know, character of their social justice cause. And a lot of my Palestinian Israeli friends feel like they're they're sort of being used now, that they're being, um, you know, upheld as you know to to, to burnish the uh, credentials of this protest to the outside world. I can tell you a funny story actually um, that 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 really reflects uh, this tendency among some of the younger uh, Jewish Israeli protesters. Um, Matan Cohen, who's an Israeli anti-occupation activist, put on his Facebook page that uh, tents are going up in Janine in solidarity with July 14th. And it, it was kind of a joke, you know, that, that a refugee camp would put up tents in solidarity with an Israeli protest. But one of the um, protest leaders didn't see the humor in it. And she went on a television program on Russia Today and said, the people of Janine are actually in solidarity with us and they've put up tents. So I don't think they even understand the Palestinian mentality enough to, to recognize uh, what it would take to bring them on board. From what I understand, the protests were postponed uh, this past weekend because of the attacks on the South on Thursday. In the meantime, Israel's launched attacks in Gaza, leaving 14 dead, rockets and mortars were aimed at Israel, and the army went into Hebron, clashing with beating and arresting many Palestinians. Could an escalation in this sort of violence mean uh, that sustaining the movement becomes increasingly difficult? Well, there was a lot of talk at the beginning, um, right when the first tents went up, that if it started to spread, which it was likely to do because there was a lot of discontent and frustration in Israeli society, that... Uh, Netanyahu would start a war. The way that Netanyahu has managed to ram through his, um, you know, financial reforms, which are basically like Tea Party Republican-style financial reforms, um, and he's done, he's rammed them through in a country that has a long tradition of socialism, at least socialism for its ethnic majority, is uh, through the Bitachon narrative. Bitachon doesn't really have a translation in English, but it basically means security, and I would sort of interpret it as um, stoking um, hysteria, fear, and, uh, in, and sort of consolidating the Israeli siege mentality to keep people focused on um, the, the Palestinian issue so that um, they would uh, agree to whatever um, you know, the, the Likud's domestic agenda was. We saw that with the Gaza withdrawal when uh, Sharon managed, who's when Ariel Sharon, who's financial minister, was Netanyahu, uh, managed to get the consent of all the Zionist left parties and Kadima for the withdrawal of settlers from Gaza in exchange for their vote on his budget, which ravaged the public sector and the middle class and has led directly to these protests. And so 
the protesters have been saying, we know that Netanyahu may try to initiate a war, but we're going to resist it. We're going to stay out there. And the people on the, on the left who have, you know, insinuated themselves into the protest say this presents the potential for, if not an anti-occupation movement, then an anti-war movement, because people will see where the government's priorities are, that, that, that it's not with them, it's with the military. And they've been hoping this could lead to a cut in the military budget. But now we have to look at the demonstration, the, the behavior of the demonstrators. Many of these demonstrators are reservists in the Israeli army. I ran into one who was a, a border patrol uh, officer who I interviewed last year. And during the interview, he told me he was upset that you know the courts were getting in the way of him basically offing as many Palestinians as he wanted. And he was in a tent protesting. So these are people who are likely going to be called up if there is a major escalation in Gaza. Uh, I expect that they would go and that the protests would, it would significantly thin out the ranks of the protest, if not cancel them completely. Um, the protest, was, they were gearing up for a major protest, I think this Saturday um, or last Saturday, and it was canceled to have a memorial service. So I can't be an oracle and predict what would happen. Something really remarkable could happen, but this does present, I think, an existential um, choice for this movement. And we have to remember that many of the people who are filling the ranks of this movement, who are the mainstream of the July 14th protest movement, are saying that they demand better um, services, better prices, and more respect as a reward for their service in the army, um, that they've done their duty. So there isn't, I, I didn't personally detect any sort of anti militarist um, mood within the rally, and it may be wishful thinking um, that they could resist this, but uh, this, is the, this is the test right now. Is there a relationship between the Jewish diaspora and uh, the protests? Well, I mean, first of all, it's important to note the Jewish federations, which is really the largest um, Jewish diaspora group in the U.S. It has a chapter in every major city, and it's sort of an umbrella group for the American Zionist movement has endorsed these protests, and so have all the most of the major Jewish organizations, um, but I don't think they really understand them or care about them. And when you talk about the diaspora Jewish mentality, I mean, you're talking about an identity crisis. Uh, since the 70s, there's been a fear that young Jews in the U.S. will assimilate to the point that they aren't Jews anymore, um, partly because their parents are secular and they've, their religion has fallen away. So the two poles of Jewish identity sprung up. On the one end, the Holocaust, and on the other end, Israel. You simply had to wave an Israeli flag um, to be considered a good Jew, uh, which is why we're seeing the Jewish tent become open to anti-Semites like Glenn Beck. Um, and so their view of Israel is sort of a G.I. Joe Israel that's constantly fighting you know, to save the Jewish people. And this all relates to maintaining the occupation. Without an occupation, the G.I. Joe Israel would become sort of unnecessary. Uh, there, they wouldn't have necessarily a full conscription. So the uh, archetype of the heroic, brawny Israeli soldier, the new Jew, would, would deteriorate. Uh, you know, wealthy doctors from Long Island would not be <laughs> bequeathing their daughters as ritual offerings to these soldiers every summer. It would just become kind of pointless and people would see, start to see Israel as Liechtenstein and it wouldn't confirm uh, or you know, help resolve this identity crisis among American Jews. So I think there's a, pretty much a lack of interest um, by the uh, Jewish diaspora, except for like the really seriously concerned uh, Jews who I see you know, writing online, who some of them are Zionists, some of them aren't, but they're like, very concerned about what happens in Israel, and they re represent, I think, a minority in the American Jewish community. And, I, and it's, it's very revealing, I think. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? I guess I would just go back to what I said before, that uh, a lot of people have put, uh, people I respect, uh, who have sacrificed a lot, um, who've physically sacrificed a lot, and who've put them on the fringe of a society that really um, hands out benefits based on who's considered, you know, a member 
card-carrying member who's part of the Yishuv um, are putting enormous hope in this movement. And I think, as with the Obama campaign, but I think to a more dis extreme degree, uh, they've set themselves up for enormous despondency. Um, and that if this movement fails to deliver um, what they hope it will, it, it, it's really time to start asking why there isn't more vocal support um, among all Israelis who support ending the occupation for things like BDS. Um, and that we can't just say that Israeli society is not capable of creating change from the inside and that it requires external pressure. Um, it requires international civil society um, to start uh, pushing the, the country and the society and the, the best mechanism for this is full BDS. Another, uh, another um, case I'd make for BDS in the context of these protests is that uh, last week or a week and a half ago, when the protests moved into the periphery, into the cities outside Tel Aviv, they called off the Tel Aviv protest and moved into 14 cities all around Israel to expand the strength of it around the nation. One of those cities was Ariel which is a mega settlement that cuts deep into the heart of the West Bank. And this uh, demonstration was endorsed on the official website of the July 14th movement. So if they can't see any distinction between the settlements and Israel proper, why should we? You know, if, if they are supporting a social just, justice protest in the West Bank, then why shouldn't we support full BDS? The, the case against full BDS is that the settlements are somehow disconnected from mainstream Israel. But now we see, even in the context of a social ju justice protest, that they're not. Um, and that's going to be one of the outcomes of this movement, I hope, is uh, that BDS and external pressure will be strengthened if the internal pressure fails. Will you be coming out with a video or perhaps an essay on the subject? Well, I did a lot of video. I'm not sure if I'm going to edit, edit it, but me and Joseph Dana, uh, the Israeli journalist, uh, have written a long piece that presents our analysis of the protest, and we're just shopping it right now, but it, it should appear within the next week. And I'll continue following um, what's going on on my Twitter feed, which is Max Blumenthal, and at my website, maxblumenthal.com. Thank you for being with us on Palestine Studies TV. I look forward to your next project. Thanks a lot for having me.